Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for your patience. This is the uh, eighth event of the virtual symposium, Recursive Colonialism, Artificial Intelligence and Speculative Computation. We are the Critical Computation Bureau, a collective of researchers, artists and writers working at the intersection of technology and culture, computer science and information theory, aesthetics and politics. Recursive Colonialism, Artificial Intelligence and Speculative Computation 2020 aims to provide interventions in the technopolitics of racial capitalism and its re recursive regeneration, mixing together critical and creative practices and borrowing models and methods from philosophy of technology, black studies, political theory, computer science and information theory, media aesthetics, cultural and digital media theories. Please check our manifesto on the website and the online special issue, uh, Control Societies at 30, published in the Periscope of Social Text Online. We also thank Duke University, uh, which has sponsored this symposium together with the University of Pennsylvania and University of Naples, Lo, Lo Orientale. For more information on this project or to contact us, please feel free to check out our website, www.recursivecolonialism.com and to follow our socials. My name is Ezekiel Dixon Roman. My co-facilitator is Oana Parvan. We've called this day of the symposium, episode 09, Pirate Modernity and Hypersocial Networks. The format of this session will be the following. Our guests will both talk for 20 minutes each, then 10 minutes each. After that, the speakers will address a few questions that, that you can type into your Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please remember to state clearly which speaker your question is addressed to. Our co-facilitator will pick up as many questions as possible, and the chair will address them to the panelist. I also want to remind our speakers not to check the Q&A box, as all, as all questions will be verbally asked by the chair. Please type in your question in the Q&A box at any time of the session. The session is streamed live on our YouTube channel as well. Today, we are very proud to host a dialogue between our guests, Ravi Sundaram and Tiziana Terranova. Ravi Sundaram is a professor at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies in Delhi. In 2000, he founded the Sarai program along with Ravi Vasudevan and the Rax Media Collective. Sundaram is the author of Pirate Modernity, Media Urbanism in Delhi and No Limits, Media Studies from Delhi. Sundaram has, co has co-edited the Surai Reader, Reader series, The Public Domain, The Cities of Everyday Life, Shaping Technologies, Crisis Media, and Frontiers. His current research looks at the worlds of circulation at the mobile phone, information fever, ideas of transparency and secrecy, and the post-colonial media event. Tiziana Terranova is Associate Professor of Cultural Studies and New Media in the Department of Human and Social Sciences, University of Naples, Lo Orientale. She is the author of Network Culture, Politics for the Information Age, and numerous essays about digital media and journals such as Theory, Culture, and Society, Culture Machine, New Formations, Sea Theory, and in, and in edited collections. She is a member of Euro, Euronomade, and a co-founder of the Technoculture Research Unit. Welcome to you both and over to Ravi and Tiziana. Thank you, Tzikiel. Here we are again. Uh, we're almost at the end of this tour de force, which we initiated. Uh, it's been very, very rewarding. And, uh, you know, we all learned a lot, I think. Um, at least for me, it's been a learning experience. And it's such a pleasure for me also to be having this dialogue with Ravi Sundaram today. Uh, which we uh, call Parade Modernity and Upper Social Network. So I'm going to start with uh, my presentation and, uh, and then, uh, you know, I will uh, uh, leave it uh, uh, up to him. Uh, here it is. I'm going to close video because it can be very distracting. Okay. Uh, so today's um, uh, presentation, again, like last time, the, like the last one I, I gave together, I had together with Ian Chambers, it's very much indebted uh, to an intellectual milieu. Uh, it's not quite the undercommons, uh, because maybe it's a bit more structured than that, and it's got 
a kind of tradition in the kind of radical milieu of the left of the global north very much. Uh, but this is where uh, the ideas that I'm about to present to you as a contribution to this, this post symposium we discussed, where a lot of the ideas uh, came from, and where there is actually a, like a larger series of conversations going on. Uh, global north, quite pale as well, <laughs> Uh, from Milan uh, to Finland, uh, to Canada, to the United States, uh, uh, to Amsterdam, London. Uh, uh, these are some of the places uh, and some of the names. Germany, uh, where uh, uh, these notions of the kind of computational social, the techno-social and its potential for something that has been called digital socialism uh, have been discussed and which I would like to share with you today. Furthermore, however, Today, uh, another possible venue for this kind of discussion has been inaugurated as the Fundación Saber Futuro in, in Chile, uh, which uh, uh, is starting its activity today. And Mercedes Bunz and Nick Schmidtek are going to be uh, there uh, talking. It's also engaged uh, in this process of discussing uh, the politics of the uh, techno social uh, in the context of Chile's. Uh, 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 transformation of its constitution with the abolition of the old uh, uh, constitution uh, uh, drafted by Pinochet. So good luck with uh, to them and to Saber Futuro as uh, one of the spaces where probably conversations are going to be uh, going on uh, as well around the subject in the South uh, this time and not uh, so much in the North. Uh, so what I would like to talk to you about today is uh, something, a debate that started, I think, in earnest, uh, somehow in the early 2010s, and which has become the object of the research which I'm conducting and writing up for a book that should come up with uh, uh, Minnesota University Press uh, next year or so. And this uh, um, debate uh, we could call the return of the social in the early 21st century, and this is actually the title of William Davis. Uh, um, essay, uh, essays, articles uh, uh, about this question. Uh, it was a debate that took place uh, uh, mostly on uh, websites, uh, thinking about open democracy or online journals like First Monday or eFlux. Uh, this debate was confronting the fact that after the dot-com crash of 2001, and after the financial crisis of 2008, a new generation or a new kind of, uh, um, some not so new, but anyway, it was a kind of uh, olig oligopoly was emerging, a uh, new dominant internet companies such as Facebook, uh, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, uh, fans, uh, which were dominating uh, uh, the internet and had completed the corporatization of uh, uh, online culture. Uh, these companies, especially uh, social media, but not just, were also uh, um, drawing on this idea of uh, this calling themselves social or appealing uh, and mobilizing the idea of uh, uh, social networking, social cooperation. Uh, this went together, as William Davis noticed, uh, with a kind of return of the social in terms uh, uh, connected to kind of governmental policies uh, and management strategies uh, uh, such as social innovation, but also social neuroscience. Uh, uh, it was this kind of larger return of the social, uh, which, however, uh, kind of broke with the uh, previous notions of the social, such as formed uh, in Europe, uh, uh, in Western Europe in the 19th century, uh, uh, culminating in the 20th century on a global scale and declining uh, in the 19, starting in the 1970s. Uh, what these commentators, I'm thinking about Jody Dean writing First Monday, or Gert Loring again, uh, interrogating the nature of the social or social media in particular, commented that this seemed to be a social that had broken with its previous associations with socialism. It was a social, as Davis called it, compatible with neoliberalism, a social identified with the shape of the network, the social network composed of individuals which foreclosed all possibilities of uh, uh, collectivity. So a social that was overall identified with processes of circulation. In uh, uh, suggesting that this new social was actually something that was identified with networks and processes of circulation of information networks. 
and computer simulation or graphical representation of the social as a network. Many of them uh, included references to Jean Baudrillard, and in particular to his essay In the Shadow of Silent Majorities, published in the late 1970s. Uh, the second part of the essay is actually called The End of the Social, and here Baudrillard postulated that uh, the social as modern abstraction, as space, uh, a second order simulation, uh, based in a kind of space of perspective, uh, uh, which was uh, conceivable starting from the panoptical kind of gaze, was being dissolved into the hypersocial uh, as a third order simulation where circulation prevailed and the social became a little more than utility. Uh, Baudrillard's thesis about the end of the social were actually uh, not that um, peculiar at the end, the end of the 1970s, but they actually uh, started uh, becoming uh, realized uh, uh, in the uh, 1980s and 1990s, uh, where uh, less uh, uh, provocative commentators and analysts, uh, such as Nicholas Ross, for example, could point out the social that completely lost its primary role as referent for the action of government uh, and has been displaced by uh, the uh, terms like uh, communities, uh, which were coming from activist uh, milieus, uh, but we, we, which were reconfigured as the new uh, kind of uh, uh, ter territories of belonging. The social was thus problematized uh, in the 1990s, also starting uh, uh, and also before, uh, starting from the thesis of its decline. Uh, I'm thinking here about uh, uh, the way in which Mary Poovey, uh, in the history of modern fact and other essays, uh, uh, um, problematized uh, or reconstructed a kind of genealogy of the social, considering it not as a pre-existing reality, but something that Foucault would call a transactional reality, something that was a product of specific techniques of observation and measurement, which presupposed uh, uh, strategies of abstraction uh, of an uh, observer, you know, techniques of the observer, as Jonathan Crady uh, uh, called them, and uh, which uh, relied on the uh, so-called modern fact. Uh, in particular, the, the term social emerges in the writings of British moral philosopher as a kind of uh, imitation of natural philosophers. So it's about the social nature of human beings, uh, which then becomes this kind of freestanding uh, uh, attribute that can be used for everything, social economy, social cooperation, and so on. Uh, Raymond Williams also testifies to the association of the social with socialism by distinguishing between two different uh, meanings of the social, one which was uh, descriptive and so associated with the new social sciences, uh, and the other one instead which was was affirmative. This was a social socialism which opposed individualistic society uh, by arguing for collective and communitarian ownership of the means of production. Michel Foucault in Discipline and Punish uh, also gave an account of the origin of the social by looking at these institutions, in particular the disciplinary technologies and disciplinary institutions such as detailed in the uh, um, mag magisterially described in uh, uh, Discipline Punished the Birth uh, of, uh, of the Prison. Uh, the rise of the social in the 21st century uh, comes also, uh, comes then after two decades of decline. Uh, this decline didn't come naturally. Uh, it was something that as uh, Wendy Brown has forcefully argued in a recent essay in the ruins of neoliberalism, uh, which also draws on uh, Melinda Cooper family values uh, between neoliberalism and new social conservatism, uh, was actually the result of uh, uh, an attack uh, on, on, the, on the notion of the social uh, by neoliberal thinkers uh, uh, as uh, a vague abstraction, not something that did not have any reality outside uh, in, the, uh, in social scientists, the social in, in the minds of social scientists, uh, for Wendy Brown, uh, the social has been the language uh, through which to articulate the experience of oppression. Uh, so something that can account for uh, structural oppression uh, without reducing it to the moral fault of specific groups or individuals. And hence uh, an attack on the idea of the social is an attack on the very left 
and on the idea of structural oppression and structural transformation. Also, Melinda Cooper has pointed out how neoliberalism is not just about the diffusion of market economics, but it's also about traditional uh, uh, value, family values and the new social uh, conservatism. Uh, the social network then uh, comes back as the shape of the social after two decades uh, of uh, dismantling of uh, the very uh, logic of the social, both as a constituent uh, part of uh, the technology of government, a ways in which governments justify the action in uh, the peak of this period uh, between the 1930s and the 1950s. And to many then the social network in particular uh, seems to have represented the, the decomposition of the social as a collective plane of action and the belonging uh, into a set of isolated individuals connected uh, uh, by uh, weak, uh, uh, by weak uh, links. Uh, actually, uh, it, the a genealogy, uh, I mean, uh, this is something that we can see um, at work uh, uh, in uh, uh, social media uh, platform in particular, but all kind of contemporary uh, networking computational platform where the social network organizes uh, through a series of digital objects and interfaces, uh, uh, the uh, front end, uh, front -end uh, interface with users. Uh, so uh, it's become the social network, the dominant uh, interface to the social in ways that uh, also mobilize and uh, uh, subsume uh, different kinds of social software. Uh, again, uh, the new um, messaging apps uh, uh, constitute also an, an interesting counter development baby, but the image of the social networks remain, uh, while at the back end, uh, uh, the social network provides the means by which uh, a new kinds of metrics, including centralities uh, and density and uh, all kinds of clusters and connections can be uh, plotted. Uh, and this is, I think, it's uh, the way in which uh, the social network uh, is becoming uh, conceptualized and modeled as a medium on the one hand, and, and again, a computational structure uh, at, the back, at the back end. A genealogy of the social network in the context of the larger genealogy of the social also reveals some interesting associations. Uh, so the rise of social network analysis as a minor branch of the social sciences, which is explicitly uh, mobilized uh, by its practitioners in opposition to mainstream methods in sociology, such as the sample survey, uh, which is compared to a sociological meat grinder, a social network analyst say that it destroys, or, or used to say that it destroyed or relationality, actually starts uh, in the heydays of the social, in the, in the early uh, years of the 20th century. Uh, um, and it's uh, a method of uh, studying of social groups, uh, which uh, is deployed especially, or it starts being deployed in, in, in social groups uh, uh, which are outside the kind of disciplinary uh, formation of technologies of uh, modern uh, modern uh, Europe, uh, it's uh, uh, the, the first uh, one of the first conceptualization of social networks uh, uh, is given by Radcliffe Brown, the anthropologist, the British anthropologist, uh, uh, which uh, uh, considered it. As a, as a tool, an instrument for the study of, of the functional structure of so-called primitive society and uh, uses it uh, in its uh, studies of Aboriginal societies in particular. Uh, uh, but it's also the idea of the social network also arises in Jacob Moreno's mind, uh, uh, the psychiatrist, uh, Hungarian psychi Romanian psychiatrist who uh, uh, comes up with it uh, for the first time when noticing the breakdown of social life in a very disciplined artificial community of the refugee camp of Mittendorf during World War I and proceeds to apply it uh, to his uh, study of the breakdown of discipline and the epidemics of fugitivity in uh, the Hudson uh, uh, School, a reformatory school for girls, uh, which was also segregated uh, uh, space in Upper State New York. Further studies, which also deployed or revealed this kind of existence of uh, unruly flows, which uh, disturbed this period organization 
and which were mapped to social networks also concerned, for example, the famous Horton study of the Horton factory in Chicago, which revealed that beneath the assembly line, connections between workers were also involved in slowing down uh, productivity. Uh, these uh, uh, models uh, of uh, social networks, which were uh, again uh, involved uh, uh, the use of graphical images or uh, of matrix uh, like uh, um, renditions, uh, which emphasize relationality and calculability or relation, were, however, mostly applied to small groups and demanded painstaking kind of uh, manual uh, work of recording data. Uh, the big turn will happen, of course, in the uh, years 2000s, uh, when data uh, coming from the World Wide Web, and which was enabled by the HTTP protocols, actually allowed for uh, a new kind of mapping of the hyperlinking structures of connections between websites, preparing the way for the techniques that are today used uh, by uh, big data man mining, by social networking platforms and other kind of apps. So uh, in uh, structured dynamics on networks, uh, the kind of uh, major players in the field, such as Barabasi and Watts and Newman, uh, will argue that the new study on network or, or, or networks was uh, dynamic and linked to complexity theory draw on mathematical biology as a kind of uh, uh, historical precedence for the use of social uh, network analysis with large and dynamic uh, data, where the social was conceptualized as a milieu of contagion, where contagion could also be used to represent uh, uh, difference. Now, these uh, uh, new computational capabilities uh, of uh, uh, social analysis Analysis, automated social analysis, such as at the moment practiced by uh, all kind of, uh, by the so-called funds, but by all kinds of operators and actors uh, in the platform economy, have been the subject of intense uh, debate and study. And this is something that I've been exposed to in uh, my travels to the global north, so to speak. You can find here some of the texts uh, uh, that are discussing it from different perspectives uh, the implication of uh, uh, this new availability of data and the new kind of instruments, uh, uh, so these techniques that now are being deployed in machine learning. I think that Bernard Reeder um, also makes a very good job in showing the integration of all the older tools of statistics and the new tools of network analysis uh, in the kind of data analysis uh, performed by this company. But uh, what has happened is that uh, all this uh, data is causing a, a return, a kind of a haunting of today's uh, advanced capitalist digital culture, we, uh, threatening it with the return of the old socialist calculation debate. So the idea, uh, the debate was discussed in the 1920s, 30s and, 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 uh, and, and 40s, uh, that uh, um, socialist central planning could actually be a superior form of economic organization than the, price, the market uh, price systems. A debate which uh, um, neoliberal thinkers such as Hayek and von Mises actively participated in and uh, where you know, a lot of core ideas uh, of, uh, the kind of the neoliberal uh, uh, notion of competition in particular uh, were formulated uh, with the idea that uh, prices, uh, the price uh, constitutes a form of compression of information, which is actually the most efficient way to regulate an economy. Uh, this involves, uh, as Eugenie uh, Morozov uh, has very well uh, uh, discussed and outlined in this uh, article called Digital Socialism, uh, actually this involves uh, um, quite different conception of competition and economic exchange. And uh, uh, today's uh, the socialist calculation debate has been resurrected uh, with the idea that today's digital technologies actually allow for uh, the return on new types of planning uh, on the one side. So for a kind of reinvention of socialist modes of ownership and uh, uh, planning of the economy also in the face of ecological catastrophe, rising inequalities and injustices. Uh, and on the other side, however, uh, also you have had denunciation of the new kind of surveillance uh, capacities enabled by these technologies, 
and uh, also as well as arguments about the possibility of reinventing capitalism by using, uh, by kind of displacing money with data, uh, as in Victor Meisterberg's uh, uh, reinventing capitalism uh, argument, to which we can oppose uh, uh, Daniel Soros, uh, the abolition uh, thesis of the abolition of capital by digital uh, socialism. Mm, also, uh, we used to like Ulls, uh, a recent book, uh, very favorably received in Italy, uh, reviewed by Sandro Mezzadra, on rein the reinvention of the welfare state. And of course, the ongoing effort by Trevor Schultz and Nathan Schneider uh, to uh, Trevor Schultz with platform cooperativism. So I would like to conclude uh, uh, this by saying that uh, to me, what's interesting, what, what is happening, and I think it's uh, something that this conference or this symposium uh, is also uh, as, a, as a kind of way to start this larger process of studying and conversation around uh, uh, artificial intelligence, speculative computation, and recursive colonialism. I think that the consideration of the ways in which uh, uh, the social, you know, rather than being a kind of uh, a pre-existing reality, but a, a, a kind of a product of the kind of recursive logic, logic of modern technologies of power in their relation with the contingency of social struggle, uh, can also uh, uh, engage with the idea uh, that the social is being turned into something that contra Baudrillard or against this reading, it can be turned uh, hyper-social by emphasizing the connectedness uh, uh, socialist medium of propagation, where the autopoetic patterning uh, of itself recursively secured, recursively secured by a computational platform, continuously turn into the socialist or computational model, uh, such as instantiated by social physics, uh, data science, uh, uh, the data logical, as uh, Patricia Clow called it, the computational social sciences and machine learning. These two sides are at the moment uh, uh, almost separated. So on the one hand, uh, the socialist medium, I think, is uh, closer to what uh, Ravi Sundaram has called this agile infrastructure of possibility. And also, I think it was something that uh, Nick Dyer Witherford also yesterday evoked, you know, in this new organizational capacity of the new generation of writing. And how could this side of the social be connected to the other side, which is the side which seems to be completely occupied uh, uh, by uh, power. So there has been talk about democratization of AI and opening of the eye also in the circles concerned with digital socialism. And this is how I would like to conclude my presentation, uh, leaving uh, the uh, floor uh, to uh, Ravi. Thank you for Thank listening. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Tiziana. Um, I, I'm actually delighted uh, to, to be here, and I've been on a panel with uh, Tiziana before, and I remember how important uh, her book was for us in India when it first came out. And so I'm particularly delighted that we're doing this together today. Now, as someone who lives in the Global South, my interest has been on uh, post media and network populations, notably their capacities for political and aesthetic action. This has been a particularly demanding period to reflect on these questions. Like many, I have tried to make sense of what the past year has meant after the COVID-19 pandemic. Like elsewhere, it has been catastrophic for the working poor in India with no end in sight. In a familiar story, uh, Indians are witnessing the expansion of bio biomedical and informational infrastructures. The country has seen an erosion in civil rights under an authoritarian right-wing regime. Even in the midst of a catastrophe like COVID-19, we see an unrelenting commitment to a neoliberal design. Crisis vitalizes network architectures, driving it in new directions. Thinking in a catastrophe, I think, can be both troubling and productive. Uh, take, for example, that classic 20th century text of critical theory, The Dialectic of Enlightenment, by Adorno and Horkheimer, written during World War II, and humanity hurtling towards destruction. At that time, one of the central questions for classical critical theory was the mechanization of the collective. This was shaped by the emergence of media technology, notably cinema, paralleling the rhythms of industrial capitalism. For example, for example, in Siegfried Krakauer's The Mass Ornament, 
published in the 1920s, synchronized forms of collective behavior are presented as akin to mechanized production. This renders the mass as increase, increasingly functional to capitalist ratio. By the mid 1940s, critical theory's argument for the growing rationalization of collective energies intimated in the mass ornament seems to have come a full circle. In the widely circulated chapter on the cultural industry in their dialectic, Adorno and Horkheimer suggested that industrial media played a key role in homogenizing diverse populations into consumers. In this argument, Mass culture produced docile subjects framed by false needs that were created by media corporations. The larger implication of the culture industry thesis was, I think, a closure of the European 19th century and a significant reworking of its model of the social. The argument was that the mass had been significantly reassembled by media infrastructures. By the 1960s, it was suggested that post-war populations were tamed by the boom and mass television, dispersing the dangerous energies of the industrial crowd. The dramatic manifesto-like aesthetic of the dialectic of enlightenment is catastrophic thinking at its best. Uh, enlightenment had become myth, progress had regressed into barbarism, and positivism reigned supreme. Their words could be a commentary on our present. And, and I quote, in the mysterious willingness of the technologically educated masses to fall under the spell of any despotism in its self-destructive affinity to nationalist paranoia, all this incomprehensible senselessness, the weakness of contemporary theoretical understanding is evident. I, couldn't, I can say that about India and I'm sure it applies to the world today. Even if the culture industry thesis was wildly incorrect, it produced a framing device that lasted until 1968. I want to use this mode of thinking at multiple vantage points to begin my presentation. I'll try and connect as best as possible with Tiziana. There are three parts to my exposition, all of which are linked in some way or the other. The first is a problematization of a condition I have called pirate modernity. At the core of this is the emergence of media enabled and networked driven populations in the South, transforming public affect and the political aesthetic. This forces a challenge to the post-colonial social arrangement. Multiple pathways emerge from this first problem. This includes an infrastructure of calculation, which financializes the social, animating, optimizing vast populations in real time. Biometric and welfare architectures define this flow. The final point is the manipulation of crisis as a productive site of the political aesthetic. There's a lot of commentary on platform capitalism, which sees the present moment as a kind of tabula rasa, beginning with social media platforms. In this, we actually have a larger story. It's a long story, beginning with informal video and audio in the 1980s in the global south, the emergence of the first decade of new media in the 1990s. The rise of new media in the 1990s was a distinct breakthrough, bypassing both older cultural industry and classic avant-garde debates. New networks of independent collaboration emerged, creatively bypassing corporate networks. Following the cassette boom in the 1980s, media infrastructures expanded rapidly in the post-colonial world in the context of an informal economy. And this is very important. And this connects to what this Yana just said. It's a large informal economy. Across the South, we saw an endless profusion of personalized media gadgets from expensive smartphones to low cost models used by the poor. And this is really difficult to sum up a pre Netflix, pre algorithmic hegemony. And this, in my opinion, largely continues in the culture of the poor across the South and in the culture of migrant working people across the North. Like cinema in the 1920s, uh, fascinated writers like Krakauer for its relationship to the mass, this post-colonial debate was defined by low-cost video. The typical sites were in VCD players and often in Nokia phones. 
The scholar Ina Blom argues that media technologies are not just simply, simply tech, the technical infrastructures of a familiar cultural bear. They affect a transformation in memory. Video must be seen, and this is a classic grab, uh, video must be seen in its capacities to act and the mode of memory it, it articulates is based on the genuinely creative or indeterminate elements. Video, Blom says, is an actant, but an unstable and disjointed one bringing out a capacity for connection and association across a broad range of phenomena. This played out quite radically in the post-2000 era in India, if not across Asia. Scholars have documented this across Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Ito Stel has called the video landscape of this decade an economy of poor images floating, and I quote, on the surface of temporary and dubious data pools. As the videos moved along different platforms, primetime television, inexpensive cellular phones in working class areas, online archives, the space of the courtroom, they became players in changing environments, producing sensational pornographic and disruptive political effects. These interventions operated along an expanded and often chaotic governmental surveillance regime and a visceral media archive that emerged from the private collections of accident witnesses, estranged lovers, paramilitary torturers, and ordinary citizens, all with camera equipped phones. Many of the elements that are distinctive of the social media era can be traced to this time. Stell, for example, wrote of the countless transfers and reformattings that marked pirate aesthetics. They were over-informationalized surfaces and jagged audioscapes. The nervous movement of the pirate aesthetic bears comparison with the meme culture of the post-2010 era. And these are all forms of circulation that go through markets, small shops, and bypass the corporate model. This remarkable expansion really took place via informal infrastructures just before platform capitalism became dominant. It has produced shadow infrastructures that continue even to this day. What emerges is what the anthropologist Brian Larkin has called a doubling of infrastructure, where capacities for poetics and shadow articulations emerge and retreat. This is the context of a condition I call pirate modernity. As it proliferated, pirate modernity disrupted not just capitalist control, but also the lives of subaltern urban populations who are part of this mediatized world. This is the great aporia. Even as it created radical conditions of possibility for subaltern populations, in this, in, in this world, pirate culture drove them to the edge of permanent technological incorporation. More critically for our discussion today, pirate modernity produces an implosion of the post-colonial social. Post-colonial governance, for example, operated within a code that separated the social and the informational and the media. Welfare and information was the domain of governance, while regulators and courts managed public affect. So governmental power periodically filtered and differentiated between two orders of circulation, of people and things, and of public affect. Participation was very classic. It was via politics and welfare purged of its medial infrastructure. In the contemporary conditions, where political affect and sensory expression appear blurred, the old hierarchies seem unstable. Confronted by media-enabled populations for which it had no place, the post-colonial design basically comes apart. In effect, we had a radical multiplication of the sensory unanticipated by post-colonial design and sovereign power. As I argued a few years ago, we witnessed the rise of a new loop-like movement that shapes much of contemporary media circulation. Here, objects move in and out of infrastructures, attach themselves to platforms of political aesthetic action, and are drawn to or depart from the spectacular time of media events. In short, we have a problem of sovereignty. I can speak for the Indian case. One of the main moves have been attempts to resolve the problem of designation. Here, the problem of designation is as follows. Here, populations move between multiple representational formats, political, welfare, and somatic. India initiated the world's largest biometric ID scheme, or Aadhaar, which expanded from a biometric ID scheme 
to be positioned as a digital backbone of finance, welfare, and the management of populations in general. And this relates to the previous presentation. Since, since, since the 19th century, colonial and post-colonial paper-based information system, uh, organized populations and welfare, paper, paper systems were shaped by multiple writing practices. And this is a, a land deed. You can see, see what I'm talking about. A land document to be precise. Offering diverse, so, so these systems, overwritten, multiply, multiply notified, offer diverse options for poorer populations for selective entry and exit into information structures. That's the beauty of it. Overwriting multiplicity and opacity marked paper. The move to biometric identification was aimed at obliterating this opacity. In this neoliberal model, financial flows govern transactions between the power and the governed and between the governed themselves. All welfare payments are now supposed to be transferred electronically to replace the cash economy. There is always an ambiguity in the relationships that govern the zone. The relationship is really a permanently updating transaction. The important thing is that the you have to see the centrality of disciplinary control here. Just after the COVID-19 uh, crisis in India, tens of millions of migrant workers in cities lost their jobs and their social security. Almost completely abandoned by the state, millions began walking home. As civic groups began mobilizing and petitioning public bodies, any help was premised on some form of enumeration. And how do you enumerate? You enumerate biometrically or you produce a bank account. The reproduction of life at this moment of crisis was premised precisely on this. Many workers did not have active bank accounts. They paid in cash. Their IDs were lost. When electronic transfers of money began after a public outcry, the value was actually useless. As shops for the poor only take paper money, where are you going to transfer your electronic money? Food cards were valid only in some states and not the others. Imagine having a food card in Naples and not having it valid in Venice. So, so here you have this bizarre situation. So you have really a transformation of the social. In, in quite dramatic ways that suddenly came to fore. Two decades ago, in their classic text, uh, Jeffrey Barker and Susan Lesta argued that the counters of infrastructure become visible only during its absence or a breakdown. Here, discipline and control combine multiple fields at different points. William Davis uh, usefully calls this shift in recent years as emblematic of a chronic social, a demanding fluidity. There's always a fluidity where the flux of boundaries becomes generative for a neoliberal project. The other move has been the expansion of infrastructure's qualities. Media is now atmospheric in that it has become more widespread, even an elemental part of infrastructure, as the scholar Durham Peters argues, existing in the background of personal devices and infrastructures. This development now frames periods of intense, affective intensity drawing in media-enabled populations and creating new capacities for the political. Atmospheric inf infrastructures seek to reassemble the model of, of the population and vitalize it. Atmospheric media brings in humans, machines, artifacts, ranging from everyday devices. There is a measuring of the activity of climates, transportation networks, and bodies, animal and human. In India, with the expansion of the platform economy after 2010, we now have a model of the social where infrastructure is thoroughly atmospheric and financialized. Now, this atmospheric move has radicalized governance ambitions in ways we could not imagine because you really have a move to app-driven governance for mobilizing public affect. So populations exist in a state of permanent optimization. There are a lot of questions for the social sciences here that, that, that uh, Tiziana has brought about. As Patricia Klaus has argued, the monopoly of social analysis has really eroded. It's shifted from sociology to the datalogical. And this opens up all kinds of questions for not just designation, but scholar, scholarship on designation. The central feature of this atmospheric shift that I just spoke about is the re-engineering of time. Atmospheric media situates itself in a language of permanent crisis. The reliance on crisis as a normal form of governmentality 
manipulates temporalities and makes a case for constant intervention. What is central here, intellectually, is the shift of the idea of crisis as marking the shift from one time to another. In the classic formulation by Reinhard Kasselek, crisis is a means of signifying time where history can be located and a switching of both past and future expectations takes place. So Kosselek used a model of critique and crisis. Even as cr crisis marked time, it allows for a reassembly of past and future. Today, digital infrastructures take crisis as a def default ecology. So here you have crisis is not a marker of historical transition as in Kosselek, now helps to optimize and modulate information and a live testing of infrastructure. Today, crisis is a diagram of atmospheric media to stimulate new events and temporalities. Each event, and this is very familiar, each event mobilizes new sensing devices and multiplies sites of attachment, media infrastructures, cultural, political, commercial, commercial all of which blur into each other. In right-wing regimes worldwide, crisis is not the exception, but the rule. Crisis enacts the performativity of sovereignty while redefining the political. In India, crisis ontology has helped Hindu nationalism to optimize techniques of mobilization across time and space. While ambulatory, media-enabled populations are subject to periodic uh, political stimuli all, all the time, online collective movements are driven by a cluster of Hindu nationalist micro-celebrities and regional performers. So Hindu nationalist supporters periodically initiate multiple event chains to attract users across digital platforms. And this could be a story all over the world. In 1985, uh, Jean Baudrillard publishes uh, his widely circulated essay, the, which is The Masses, the implosion of the social in the media, almost anticipating the digital future. The essay argued, and I quote, we will never in, in future be able to separate reality, simulate a projection in the media. Over-informed, the masses become an obese part of the silent majority. Now, Baudrillard's essay was an obituary of older forms of politics based on contingent political speech. Condemned to permanent participation, the masses have been absorbed by a late capitalist strategy of transparency. Participation is the crippling noose of the political. Here, we see the circle initiated by the dialectic of enlightenment fully complete. After the great protest we saw in earlier months, from the Black Lives Matter to the movements in Chile, I'm, I'm actually less skeptical and body our sentiments in this essay. To conclude, we can revisit the main question. Can we animate, and I'm coming to what Tiziana said from another vantage point, can we animate the collective potentials inherent in makeshift and opaque infrastructures produced by pirate practices? The opaque and makeshift have been actively delegitimized de by neoliberalism. What is remarkable in recent years has been the use of makeshift infrastructures by millions of migrants fleeing war and persecution in Burma, Syria, Iraq. There are many more stories from Africa and the Americas. Here, the phone is the only infrastructure they carry with them rather than money. The SIM card and Bluetooth have replaced the old digital CD and video. Despite the brutality of racial xenophobia by regimes all over, the 20th century reality of the camp, the poetics of infrastructure continues to be enabling in surprising ways. In this sense, I think the morose polemic of the dialectic may be behind us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Tsikir, shall I just uh, move on yeah. to answer that? Yeah, yeah. So, please um, feel free to move on to your 10 minute response. Thank you very much, Ravi, for uh, you know, giving us this uh, perspective because I really wanted to frame uh, what I said in terms of the global north because this is really where the, all these debates about the repurposing of the uh, infrastructure have been happening, uh, you know, how to reinvent uh, socialism. Uh, as a kind of new Promethean project uh, of reappropriation of uh, technology, technological instruments to turn them into a new kind of socialism. 
And of course, I mean, uh, the kind of uh, critique that has been uh, made of these attempts in the global north to rethink socialism in this term, uh, for example, by Luciana Parisi, you know, is that you don't understand the instruments. The instrument is a lot more out of control than you, than you think. It's not just something that you can uh, dominate. So I wanted to have this debate with you also because, uh, you know, these debates, of course, look different from the perspective of the, of the so-called global south, right? Where uh, the, the kind of socialism uh, was very important, uh, I think, in the process of national unification, right, as a rationale to government. But he, he, he came up mixed uh, with uh, what Foucault said was basically for him the problem with socialism was the fact that he became an administrative kind of state. He didn't have an art of government, he said. So he just assumed the form of administrative state and also kind of maybe implemented uh, also forms of colonial power, you know, the, or, or colonial, colonial model. And this is the social that you describe as having undergone uh, a crisis. So I was, I was wondering, you know, um, what do you think of this kind of Promethean attempt to think that these infrastructures, uh, you know, can be repurposed? Also, uh, considering uh, what we've been discussing in this symposium, that uh, these are not just inert tools that as soon as, you know, somebody changes uh, uh, the, the, the kind of the owner, the, the subject, the man one or man two kind of takes over these tools. So, then they're going to be made good for socialism, you know, so, so what that, those kind of debates, uh, you know, sound to you from uh, your perspective. And the other thing that I was also thinking about when you mentioned, when you were talking, was how crucial is the notion of uh, the medium? Uh, not, it's not so much crucial, but it appears uh, in uh, key sites of Foucault's lectures about biopolitics, the notion of the medium or milieu, right? And it's very much... Uh, something that is completely different from or opposite to the way in which Baudrillard, you know, conceptualizes the medium. Because uh, Foucault say uh, the, the medium or milieu is a notion that uh, he thinks uh, uh, one can find in Newton almost, in Lamarck, is the medium of an action. You know, it's where an action, uh, uh, you, can, you can see the way ac uh, causes become effects and effects become causes. Uh, so circulation is not just about uh, exhausting, you know, the circulation of capital that takes everything in its state and exhausts all possibility uh, by simply, you know, putting them in the circulation of commodities. But it's actually the process of interaction of causes and effects. It's a recursive plane uh, of, of action. And this is what uh, the kind of governmentality tries to get to. It's the, the medium is that which is... Uh, uh, cannot control uh, in uh, uh, kind of disciplinary and traditional social kind of way. And this is where he thinks then uh, kind of liberal, neoliberal governmentality starts from trying to get to the medium, uh, trying to get almost to the social uh, as medium, uh, although, you know, the medium includes everything, environmental facts, or everything that kind of interacts and acts, you know. So that's a different understanding of circulation. Uh, it's more as a kind of patterning, you know, of, of, of events. Uh, which uh, I, I think is also quite similar to what you said, because I'm a bit concerned that uh, when we kind of use the circulation in the way that Baudrillard used it, in a way it's assimilated to the circulation of capital, you know, we, we kind of lose this capacity of kind of this, this patterning, you know, that the circulation introduces, uh, and which is a way to make the connection between the medium, you know, the of communication and uh, uh, the computational medium. Uh, which uh, are almost, it's like they're, they're kept separate, you know, even the distinction between the front end and the back end uh, uh, serves to separate. Uh, so making on the one side uh, the effect of algorithm felt, but not graspable in use, and on the other side you have the engineers. So I was wondering what you thought about that. Okay, uh, and the, the number of things that I, I wanted to come in um, on, and, and uh, one is this whole idea of the social. And, and part, part of the challenge, and, and I'll come, come to Foucault a little later and Baudrillard a little later, I think one of the, the, there's, a, there's a basic pro problematic that we have faced, uh, that a bulk of the debates on the social uh, tend to take the global north as a, as a, as a, as, as a given. There's no, no problem with that. I mean, I mean there's, there's absolutely no problem, but that is a reality. Uh, you had the formation of the so-called 19th century social and the real expansion in the 20th century. Uh, where where these ties get institutionalized to the relationship to welfare, 
and and uh, and the relationship of welfare to large structures of uh, information processing from 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 social security onwards uh, so this this is largely a western uh, model and, and it's largely a western model there is an argument uh, about colonial governmentality which is uh, which in which there is a history of enumeration there's a history of enumeration there's a history of uh, forms of early anthropology that are that are classifying uh, you, you know different 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 hab habitats if you like this this has a very wide range from africa uh, to 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 india very very wide range but you really don't have the kind of uh, social habitation that you have uh, in the way in the west right? and part of the reason it's able to exist in the west is because of its unequal relationship with the rest of the this, this is a very old point but it needs to be made and yes. uh, <laughs> and it's it's crucial because there's there's a structure of exchange that is built into this relationship and uh, and and I, I, the key thing i think is the key thing and this is an argument which comes from foucault from foucault's lectures is in, in the south and i can say for india for sure and, and it, it 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 varies across parts of the world and it's true of parts of africa you have enumeration you have enumeration uh you which is which is the administrative side that you're talking about uh you have enumeration uh, because populations did not have sovereignty populations didn't have sovereignty you know col colonialism denied sovereignty it denied freedom you had freedom in the west and unfreedom in, in in the rest of the world so you have forms of complex forms of enumeration and in in the so called post colonial period i am using it purely descriptive here uh, rather than the, the the literary theory debates in in the post independence period enumeration continues and populations don't yet have full citizenship so for example i'll give you a simple example this is related to the idea of the social most populations most people in india in rural india do not uh, have uh, you know you know in 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 northern india sorry don't have title to land or to title to property they have some sort of holding is you know but they don't have title so it it is a form of informal it is an informal world that is not governed through the formalized social ties that you see in the west you, you, not yet and this is true of most parts of latin america the, these things reverberate this of course it changes it changes but but for the most part people have had to struggle politically for some form of citizenship so citizenship comes or the noumena of citizenship uh which is the which is the basis of liberal democratic participation through for different forms of struggle you know occupation etc so there's a kind of making of what is seen as a social it, it's a it's, it's a social but it's a not yet social if you like so the kind of circulation that foucault lays out uh, the, the, you know is you know the, the larger milo of circulation I'm speaking purely of social circulation which presumes in in the move that he's talking about the new by by political subject the move presumes this infrastructure which is this longer infrastructure i suspect in what you you begin to see in the rest of the world is this some sort of a hybrid social is being made it comes through forms of welfare it comes through new forms of welfare which can include uh, cash for food programs direct new liberal direct cash payments and this new infrastructure which is come with contemporary computation it's a very bizarre hybrid form it's not that one replaces the other it's a parallel and, and so you need an argument you need an intellectual argument for that uh, where you have this kind of hybrid social where you have these large structures of computation suddenly arriving uh, which are which are which are too expensive so you can build these new forms of ties this is what i call this financialized social which is actually the largest form of social transaction going on in india where uh, cash cash is transferred directly it's a, it's a neo liberal project cash is transferred directly to the poor via their by their phone accounts whether they have one or not many of them can't access it but the model is secure models of transaction through which the enumerated can reproduce themselves so you have really this disjunction you have this disjunction and i think this we need to open up intellectual so you really have not one replacing the other but book you know a very weak one replaced by a new one or in hybrid with, with another one i suspect you have similar stories from africa you know the stories from kenya there are all kinds of anatomies being played out 
So I think this is an interesting part of the story you laid out, if we globalize it. This, the other part of the story you laid out, which I found really interesting, is what happens to knowledges of the social. The entire history, you know, starting from Durkheim onwards, uh, to anthropology, to, to, to the recent debates, uh, to all the way to Foucault. What happens to knowledges of the social? When you have these large uh, information infrastructures, media companies, uh, startups coming in and operating different sites of knowledge through big data manipulation. So I think this poses a dramatic challenge for the social and historical sciences. Absolutely dramatic, uh, worldwide. And, uh, and, and, and in, in, in the South, in India, I can say, in the 1950s, there was an alliance with scholarship uh, and, and, and social scientists, anthropologists, planners, etc., uh, today, the, you have the startup and uh, the company replacing that increasingly and, and, and neoliberal consultancy. So it's a shift has been completely dramatic. Also because you don't did not have a large social infrastructure which reproduced itself like the West. So you really have a transformation and a making of some sort of a making of a new, it's, it's a not yet social. I would not, not even call it a social because it, it, it's a financialized new, neoliberal, it's, you know, what, what, what William Davis calls this chronic social, yeah. uh, which, is, which is always updating, uh, which lacks the, you know, the, the, the forms of reproduction. And, the, and, and even the milieu that Foucault laid out, which you could actually visualize, you, know, you, you knew what he was talking about. But I think every day some new thing is happening and we need to f f you know, attach uh, this to our, scho you know, our scholarly thinking. And I think that's a real challenge for us. It's a huge challenge, I know, in the South, but it's a real challenge. Yes. So I th thank you both for a really rich um, and an exciting and invigorating conversation, especially um, bringing in this question of the social and even the return of the social in and through information networks and computational logics um, and questions around private modernity um, and uh, the uh, and, and I appreciate uh, Ravi for, for bringing us to this, this notion of crisis and the ways in which, particularly in our contemporary moment, the ways in which it is enacting um, uh, new or, or, excuse me, the performativity of sovereignty and stimulating new events and even temporalities. Um, so we have a, as you can probably imagine, a whole host of questions for you all, and I'd like to definitely turn right over to them. So the first question is from Saeed Mustafa Ali for Tiziana. Insofar as platform cooperativism supervenes on a physical racial capitalist substrate, the inter, i.e. the internet, to what extent can this project get off the ground vis-a-vis -vis autonomy? Um, yeah, these are these are difficult uh, questions. I, I I think there's a lot of energy that has been put into the platform cooperatism uh, um, movement. So it's based on the idea of uh, the workers owning uh, uh, the means of production. In this case, owning capital. And you know, I, I you know, I wish the project uh, all the all the possible uh, luck in the world because I, I think that there is evidence that it's, it's actually you know allowing for different better ways of living. But uh, what I'm interested in is uh, what kind of unless you want you know platform cooperative cooperatives to compete, you know, to be in a position where they have to compete and hence. Uh, in s somehow to copy, replicate, or adapt, or be a subaltern to the kind of mainstream economics uh, or economic environment, uh, which is something that has happened, for example, in the various uh, cooperative, history of cooperatives uh, in, in Italy. Uh, so where you basically have uh, they the owned by workers, but they work, you know, like any regular company. So uh, you have limited innovations then I think that uh, we need uh, uh, to be engaged in this process, uh, in this debate about uh, how to replace the market economies uh, with non-market uh, kind of uh, um, economies uh, and, and, and modes of social government which break with the kind of tradition that we were talking about, because it's not a question of going back to the early 20th century, the 19th century, you know, the form of socialism, which was centralized, uh, and again, uh, it was so much, uh, it was about control, uh, very much, uh, uh, and uh, it, it was top-down, 
you know, he did not problematize the forms of the administrative states. So he was based in colonial relationship. So I think that he needs uh, uh, an engagement with a larger uh, question. And today, you know, that means questioning uh, the socialist medium of connectedness, where, you know, mediated uh, by computational media and, and digital interfaces, and also the kind of the way in which knowledge is of the social and the economy are together being reconfigured. So we, we have a question here from Anonymous for Ravi. Uh, thank you for your presentation. With regards to sovereignty, you explained that pirate modernity produces an implosion of the post-colonial social. What do you think is the future of the role of the state in the continuously modulatable articulations of governance? I think, uh, I, I think the interesting thing is, I think, uh, governments are, are trying to remake themselves in a sense uh, that there's a weakening of, of what we call the state over the last 20, 30 years. It's happened over a number of reasons. Uh, the, the, the idea of the population that Foucault sketched out has, has changed. It's a different model of the population very clearly. Neoliberalism has weakened the state. Uh, this is happening worldwide. In, in India, it is, it is happening in all kinds of interesting ways. You have a highly authoritarian regime, but you also have an actual weakening of the capacity of states to deliver. Uh, so you, you, I think, I think, I think the challenge now is for I think what the states seem to be doing uh, is trying to manage points of departure and entry. It's a, it's a kind of different kinds of modulation. How do you, how do you manage points of departure and entry? And so this model that I that I that, that I suggested, you have this atmospheric infrastructure where all points seem to be connected and, and, and reproducing. And uh, the idea is to inhabit as much of that atmosphere as possible. Unlike the older model, where this is what the state did, this is what the private sector did. So it's a challenge. It's a, so you have to innovate. You have to uh, make yourself like a startup. And I think it, 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 it offers all kinds of new potentials. Also one to the experiments that Tiziana was talking about, but also I think for all kinds of disruptive innovators to, uh, you know, once your designation is not clear, you can enter spheres that were, that were uh, you know, separate from you. So that is the challenge, I think. And uh, we are going to see a highly volatile time because volatile is the new normal. You're going to see that now increasingly. Thank you. Tiziana, did you want to also respond to this one or? I... Okay. Uh, okay, no. It was for me as well, and I was just listening to Ravi Sanson. I have, I have an idea about, uh, for example, the, the, the failure, you know, when um, during the COVID epidemics of the large uh, internet companies to actually engage in the kind of uh, social governments that, the, you know, the, in the sense they almost set themselves up for. Mm -hmm. You see, you know, there, there's an argument that large internet companies, they have so much data, they're not everything right so they should be able to know that the google is able to know when a, a flu epidemic a regular flu epidemic starting before doctors do because you know through search engine data but then you know during the epidemic it was like they withdrew from uh, from the actual on the ground governance and i i am also thinking about instead the chinese model instead you know it, it got there to the board so they stayed atmospheric <laughs> without actually you know getting their grasp of, on the body that they invade in China instead because of their connection to actual states mm -hmm. uh, power, you know, they managed to have. So they had a very efficient uh, uh, model of deploying uh, uh, kind of data, data and computational uh, platforms for uh, uh, actually uh, biopolitical, uh, old fashioned biopolitical uh, handling of the epidemics. So uh, I, I want to come in here, you know, there's an argument and Tiziana, you'll find it uh, interesting to respond to this. So in, in response to what, what you just said, there, there's a book uh, which was written about the uh, SARS epidemic, uh, which argued that one of the challenges, you know, Google did have a program then to, uh, to understand what people are posting online. So there's so much white noise produced about, about epidemics. You know, people are constantly posting all the, so the over, white noise basically overwhelmed accurate information. Uh, because, and we know this, we, we, we call this with white in, uh, misinformation now, and but this happened in all ep epidemics. It's going to be very, so even if 
platform capitalism intervened? Did it act? Could it be? Could it do it reflexively? It's a very interesting question. Uh, could platform capitalism do what states did in the past? Uh, create a kind of baseline of intervention. So it's going to be a very, I mean, it's going to be a challenge, I think, for uh, critical interventions because you have companies that did very, very well in this crisis. Yes. Extremely well and brutally well. Uh, so it's a challenge, I think, uh, for us to think about this. You know, what's interesting about the, the, the notion of the noise of information or misinformation that, that's produced under, under um, particularly under crisis, under pandemics, um, even in our com uh, contemporary moment. In, when you think about that intention with what's emerging of a biopolitics enumeration, such as the use of bio, biometrics or the use of biomarkers in order to even grant access to particular institutes in a particular space that you've been able to do. For instance, just to give an example, my institution, my home institution just announced yesterday that if you do not get your regular testing, you will, you can act, a staff actually potentially will be terminated from their job. Um, and so like, you know, the, the level of, of where things, the potential directions of where things potentially might be going in the acts of biopolitical enumeration are quite, um, are quite scary, scary under the current conditions. And, unfolding. Um, let me move to another question here. So um, this, uh, this next question is for specifically for, for, uh, for Ravi um, from Anna Mlad Mladenseva. Please forgive me for, if I'm, I'm sure I did not pronounce that correctly, but uh, Ravi, could you please comment on whether crypto anarchism and the rise of using blockchain for financial transactions is in line with the efforts of pirate modernism? <laughs> uh, probably, uh, probably not. I mean, I wouldn't be sh sure of that because I know it's a large range. So I can't, call you know, the world I'm speaking about are really working poor all across the South uh, who, op who opened up all kinds of, uh, you know, interesting practices for us to think about collective models of living. And, you know, when I first started thinking, it was really a critique of copyright because you have people creating shared shared forms of circulation outside copyright. Now, in, in this, it may link up to your question. That does blockchain continue that earlier critique of copyright? Probably not, because I think uh, you have large infrastructures now entering block. I hear the shipping industry is one of blockchain's biggest supporters. So we have to think of how these knowledges, just as the open source movement has moved somewhere else, we have to think of what happens to these knowledges. Uh, and, uh, the, the, you know, I, I'm very open with the volatility of it, but we need to think of particular moments in time where certain capacities build and certain things break. Uh, and uh, so short answer, probably not. Hmm. Okay, the next question here is for Titiana from Anonymous. Thank you for your talk, Titiana. How do you think that the social as a medium of propagation contributes to uh, contributes to think of sociality against the model of governance that see the social as a laboratory of power. I can repeat that one if you like. Uh, yes, by, uh, yeah, please do, please do repeat. Okay, okay. Uh, thank, you for, thank you for your talk, Titiana. How do you think that the social as a medium of propagation contributes to think of sociality against the model of governance that see the social as a laboratory of power. I think, I mean, what I what struck me when I was kind of doing research on the social network is that how social network visualizations or social network diagrams did start as a way to kind of grasp, you know, this um, socialist medium of circulation. So it was clear when uh, uh, Moreno was uh, thinking about using social network diagrams. Uh, to uh, uh, kind of socially engineer a better refugee camp mm -hmm. or a, a more functioning uh, prison or where uh, girls wouldn't run away, that there was something that was circulating in this uh, disciplinary uh, institutions, which were classically social, right? So you had barracks, you had rooms, everybody has its place, they had numbers, they were enumerated and things were breaking down, you know. Uh, the refugee camp, uh, there was friction between different populations, so girls were running away. So the, the, the social as a medium of circulation uh, uh, 
preceded the visualization of the social network from what I could see. It was what the social network was trying to kind of uh, make a, a photograph, like a picture of, so that it could, could make a diagram and experiment with a diagram to see what, you know, better diagram could actually accommodate uh, this kind of movement. So this is, uh, you know, what has emerged from my research that uh, the, the socialist medium of circulation was the problem that uh, the kind of social network diagram first and now kind of social network technologies uh, have uh, a reason uh, to tackle, you know, uh, and, and that's why the kind of the pirate, pirate modernity preceded uh, the kind of social media platform, as Ravi said, right? So there, there was uh, the, the form that was, that was needed in order to make um, governable <laughs> up to a point, uh, uh, the kind of unruly uh, circulation, which could be of audio tapes, uh, but it could be also of kind of uh, affect, you know, uh, friendship uh, in the case of, uh, uh, or, or kind of sexuality, also in the case of the prison for girls, where kind of, uh, there were like sexual relationships between black and white girls, and then they would run away together, right? So all, all of that, the social network diagram are trying to make visible, to bring into a plane of visibility. And I think, we, are, you know, today's uh, data governmentalities are, in the, are continuing that kind of uh, uh, strategy. Uh, but, you know, I, the, the diagram is also in terms of computation is also very interesting, uh, I, I think, uh, concept. Yeah, Titiana, thank you for also sort of elucidating that history of and its uh, social network analysis and its role um, and, and, and the, the emergence of even the turn or even um, shaping of, of the social, particularly in, in information networks. One thing, I mean, one question I actually have, because I'm just not familiar, I was familiar, uh, to what extent is it is social network analysis lodged in Euclidean or topological um, models of 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 geometry, if you will, and, and capturing social networks? And and if there is a distinction, if there are sort of two different forms, right? To what extent is one capturing a different visibility than the other? Um, I'm not sure about the answer. What I what I kind of figure out from my studies uh, have been that. Uh, um, it's a derivation of graph theory, and which which uh, trace back to the you know famous uh, Königsberg bridges uh, uh, problem solved by Le Leonard Euler in the um, uh, mid 18th century. It was uh, well, the first example of analysis in situ, uh, so the kind of mathematics proposed by Leibniz, uh, which was a break with the tradition that considered space as an empty. Uh, uh, Support for the uh, kind of geometry, Euclidean geometry of uh, uh, geometrical figures. So, you know, the graph theory starts as a way to make, to consider the properties of space as such. Uh, so, uh, social network analysis can be considered uh, uh, from when it starts as a way to make uh, uh, the social space uh, not just something against which the kind of social relations unfold, but something that is itself part. Of, uh, of the social process. So it was, it was a, a way to imagine and make visible the structure of, of social space. So it was, uh, I think it was not Euclidean as such. Um, it, it was kind of, it's a topological kind of space. And they oppose that to uh, sociology. So when the social network analysis was a minor paradigm, it was constantly criticizing sociological uh, methods of measurement and enumeration for destroying a social structure, for, for destroying uh, any, any account of social space. Although you know, now the two things are integrated. So there is a constant in, in uh, I'm not sure about, I don't think that's actually true for uh, possibly the kind of governmentality that uh, uh, Ravi was talking about, you know, the kind of cashless, the, the, the cashless uh, economy of the poor. We have that in Italy as well, you know, uh, the, the kind of all, all kind of welfare payments are now uh, issued by these cards, so everything is tracked, right? So it seems like the state and statistics are still very much wedded, while uh, kind of uh, they they're still not really into analyzing patterns of, uh, of the kind of patterns, the kind of speciality of the social. They're still very much statistically minded, I think. I had a comment on uh, the circulation argument, and in fact, something Christiana brought up. So one of the interesting things is in the 1950s, 
uh, you had a whole bunch of uh, US uh, planners who came to India. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a kind of model of Cold War modernism. And I'm sure they must have followed or overlapped with the, with the early cybernetic debates. So the, one, of, one, of the, one of the plans that I looked at was uh, a design for Delhi, uh, which was done by this very interesting American planner. And the idea is what form of circulation is most appropriate uh, for a transparent sense of the city. So, so the, the nightmare was in an Asian city, everything is mixed up. You know, traffic patterns are not rational. Uh, they don't they don't follow all, you know any form of order. So, so the whole thing was making orderly patterns in the city, and uh, particularly flow. And and so this this what is the appropriate form of circulation that is appropriate for a non-Western city? This is always a challenge. It is always a, so these these I think fit into the whole 1950s Cold War modernism. Uh, of that particular time. And the other point, which is which is the Borrear point, when I first read Mirror, Mirror of Production, which is really, a, you know, the critique of Marx, Marx's uh, productivism, I was actually taken in by his uh, argument for circulation, because one of the things I realized is the classic opposition between production and circulation, very, very problematic uh, in the old, older traditions. Uh, and, 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 and actually the productive side of circulation, uh, which he, he didn't really develop. He doesn't really develop it beyond a point. That's his style. Uh, he alludes to it. And I think that is something that it has really come into being in the contemporary period, uh, where you have these large infrastructures, you know, the, the, the separations don't matter anymore. They really don't matter anymore. You know, I think it's really, uh, sorry. I think the when you kind of uh, the interesting part for me now compared to when, when Borgia talk about the hyper social and you know the social circulation, you know, the, the simul simulacrum was just these things that preempted the real. Mm -hmm. But I think that today computational sci sciences uh, are not what he thought they were going to be. They do not so much, they try to predict. But it's true also, you know, that the randomness level. Uh, 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 continues to emerge, unpredictable events continue to materialize. You know, I think there is a level uh, where the kind of total subsumption that he imagined hasn't quite happened. And no, it was also no, part no. of his kind of uh, uh, metaphysics, yes, you know, yes. very much. I agree. Like, I, I, agree. In Plato. I, I agree. All right, interesting. Um, so next question is from Fatima for, um, for Ravi. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation, Ravi. In India, does the pirate infrastructures help the processes of Hindu nationalism? There is an active attempt by Hin Hindu Hindutva uh, or Hindutva um, to mobilize yeah. subaltern populations. I can repeat the question if you like. Uh, no, I understood. I understood okay. absolutely. I think for me, uh, pirate infrastructure never had any distinct political designation. Uh, it, it, it did not have a label. It, it, it's, a, it's a series of potentials. And uh, the, the difficult question uh, is that these potentials can be animated by all kinds of political forces. Unfortunately, uh, part of what we're talking about has been mobilized by right-wing populism across the world. And it has happened in India too. For example, uh, you know, informal video ne networks were used by the right in its mobilization. So in the sense you're right, uh, we have to be attentive. Uh, once you start designating a form of infrastructure and a form, you know, which has has different potential politically, it we get into all kinds of difficulties. So I think we have to see a particular conjuncture. So uh, you know, all kinds of elements have have used that. You know, there have been interesting experiments in Chile that take it the other way. So so we have to be attentive to the, the exact conjuncture. I would say. I, I've. I've... I wonder also um, how much these movements are actually like literally in direct communication. They're not. Yeah. Um, okay. so, you know, not necessarily, but I think that, you know, in the sense that, uh, you know, the figure of the leader, for example, the Sahib, you know, say Trump, Erdogan, Modi, I think there is, because of this symbolic circulation of the leader figure, using particular actions, performative actions, I don't know. It's a, going to be a very interesting, you know, site of research for us in the next few years, you know, mm -hmm. because we've had this last decade of right-wing populism uh, and using of media infrastructures. It, 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 you know, I'm sure we're going to see interesting arguments for this. Mm -hmm. So, 
All right, so the next question is from Anonymous for Titiana. Um, thank you for your talk. Could you please elaborate on how your approach to the hypersocial works against a model of the social that extends the moral law of the bioeconomical success of the social? Uh, mm, I think there, is the, there, are, there are many accounts, there are plenty of accounts has become uh, kind of dominant. And, and then there's a kind of, it's a kind of thesis, right? The dominant thesis is that uh, there is a new level of control a new level of power that has been extended to the social through a new kind of visibility afforded by uh, uh, digital networks so, uh, and the kind of computational logic, algorithmic logic. And then there is a minor thesis uh, that says that uh, uh, there, are, there is a possibility in, uh, of reappropriation and repurposing of these, um, uh, of these uh, uh, technologies uh, and this uh, kind of reconfiguration of the social that they would uh, uh, possibly produce a new form of socialism, uh, a more adequate uh, uh, form of government, which breaks uh, with a kind of modern tradition and which would help in facing the kind of challenges uh, uh, that are inherent to growing inequalities uh, uh, and uh, uh, the environmental uh, uh, catastrophe and also now the pandemic. So these are the two kind of position. I think that uh, I have a lot of, pro you know, I, I confess that for me, it's been a very challenging project because when you kind of uh, deal with something as huge as the social and especially, uh, you know, from the perspective of its end and return, which is what is happening, you are dealing with something that is enormous, just, uh, you know, the importance uh, and uh, presence of a term such as the social in uh, uh, not just throughout modernity, even in this asymmetrical relationship, but also in contemporary political culture. You know, the, so the social is a, is a kind of bone of contention and signifier is huge. So I think the hyper-social for me has become a way to understand how uh, this technological reconfiguration of the social as an object of knowledge, as a plane of governmental action, but also a, in the emphatic uh, term of the kind of the drive uh, towards uh, uh, better ways of living together, which are not based in kind of individualistic uh, uh, model of subjectivity, can still uh, uh, can still be thought even under this new condition. So it's uh, a plane of potentiality and uh, of capture of uh, uh, you know possibilities for different inflections, which has not uh, been uh, is not closed down. So the hypersocial, alike that in Vodriyar for me. It's not being closed down. It's not closed down. And it's not so easily repurposed either. But it's a kind of question. It's, it's a challenge. I say, what, what do you do, you know, with uh, uh, this return, which nobody was kind of expecting, uh, and which is, uh, seems to be all about uh, the, the capture of the social, the real subsumption of the social by economic, but which is also revealing to have its own logic and which is bringing in new forms of uh, calculation and new kinds of reason. I, I think that my problem with uh, uh, also writing this book, I have to say, it comes from the enormity of the question and that also it's incompleteness and undecidability at the moment. Um, it, it, and the enormity actually came, comes through very much in your presentation. I mean, you, the literature, the vast literature that you covered, and even just the topics in and through the social and thinking about the socials. Um, thank you. So let me um, move on to another question um, from Anonymous to Ravi. Um, Thanks for a very inspiring talk. The shadow network of audio video technology you mentioned operated by diverting cash flows from the official market to redistribute them towards the global South pirate infrastructure and its specific social formations such as street markets. How does this actually work in a digital environment and what kind of social forms and social spaces arise from the digital pirate network? Okay, this is actually a fascinating question. It's fascinating for two reasons, uh, because uh, the platforms have arrived, the platforms have arrived and making, uh, trying to monopolize different sites of circulation. This is worldwide. And in India, some of the biggest platforms include WhatsApp and Facebook uh, and other companies. So the challenge I think for this, this world has been, so it's, it's a world largely limited to the low middle class and the working poor. 
And you will see these forms of interaction among migrants in the West. And I, whenever I, I travel the world, I first ask the migrants, how do you how do you share stuff? So forms of circulation include non-cash, uh, through through Bluetooth, Bluetooth cards, you share, you share share media, or using WhatsApp chats uh, to uh, share forms of cash. And and I'm and you know, even even the migrants in North America have used different forms of cash circulation. So these are actually very interesting stories we need to understand better because we cannot flatten the story. And uh, you have such interesting stories. I mean, every time I'm fascinated by how people actually maneuver this world because a part of that, part of the larger infrastructure is closed off to them. It's closed off, right? They, are, they, are, they, are, they, have, they, they don't have citizenship. So if you don't have citizenship, you move in, in very, very deft ways. So I think... Uh, part uh, digital slice is often carved out. Digital infrastructure is carved out, and some part of platform architecture is 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 is, 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 is disrupted. You can say, because you know banks want you to share move money through them. Uh, platforms want you to use official apps to move. So I think it's it's a it's a research question because I don't have a flat answer for you because there is no flat answer. It doesn't just doesn't exist. Uh, but it happens all the time. Debit, you know, if you buy debit cards, uh, you know, temporary debit cards that migrants buy, uh, and load them with cash uh, to use, you know, short-term forms of circulation. So we have to actually work this through. But it happens all over the world. So um, this is a really interesting. I love this question. How do you share stuff? Um, uh, and it, it reminds me how in Cuba, when uh, people were seeking to share information that was supposed to be um, sort of under the radar of the, of the surveillance of the revolution, um, it used to be a joke. They would tell a joke that would have a nuance in it that would be understood right there in the quotidian level. And then it then evolved into the sharing of a flash drive. So sharing information via flash drives and what they call um, um, a, a pa pa paquete. A package, um, and now it's evolved into other other practices that I, I, I'm not even aware of at this point. But it's interesting to think about how do you share, and um, in, in, in the ways in which there are different practices around the world. So, I'm, I, I'd like to ask this this last question um, that is for both of you, um, and 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 uh, as a way of also even wrapping up. Um, so. This is from Anonymous to both of to, to both. Uh, thank you for the stimulating discussion. I would be curious, how do you think further about the dynamics of what Frank Pasquinelli characterizes as functional sovereigns? Do you think neo-cartelism um, um, slash feudalism uh, config configurations such as Google, Amazon, and other major Western companies will be compelled to undertake greater governance roles in the wake of climate change. Since we are discarding the notion of citizen and becoming refracted through the prism of data, data streams, what do you think as users subscribing and shifting to infrastructures that adhere possibilities of resilience against climate change and other disasters? Or can we possibly look at global South platform models as alternatives to an already undermined state? The possibility of democratic participation, i.e. Correo Argentino in Argentina, or Link Aja, or uh, Fique Nolar in Brazil. It's a long question. Um, and if you need me to ask it again, I can. Tiziana should go first, because she's more knowledgeable about some of this. My, my feeling is that, uh, uh, that there is something that is kind of immanent uh, in the in the way these companies have become so big, so they have billions, you know, so some of these companies are thinking about Facebook or Google, you know, like they cater to billions, literally, right? Which brings them to take on very reluctantly, I think, some kind of governmental functions, which uh, they, I say stop short from the kind of full sovereignty, you know, where you actually have law and institution to put people in prison and things like that, right? Or hospitals they're not running hospitals they're not running prisons they're not running at the moment from what, as far as i know any other kind of old state infrastructure so there is that tendency and uh, i think that's very much resisted there's something that's quite scary about that tendency in the specific culture of the united states 
which is where these companies are coming from. So we have seen quite a lot of attacks, you know, even these days, right? There's uh, the kind of anti-trust uh, uh, court cases uh, being brought against them. I think in the United States, uh, because of the kind of the, the, tra- the, the old tradition, you know, the, the kind of specific configuration or kind of uh, capital there, there is a, a strong resistance to these tendencies of these platforms to become this kind of uh, sovereign, uh, almost a socialist, uh, but for the ownership uh, state. So as far as uh, the other side of the question, uh, that's where I kind of uh, appreciate very much about this contribution in the post postcolonial uh, uh, city, the way in which he showed, uh, he talked about shadow networks, right? And I think it was something that, uh, again, Nick uh, uh, Dye Witherford also referred to yesterday. So the ways in which they kind of, uh, for example, new generations of apps such as Telegram and, and WhatsApp, uh, you know, they, which have been a product, as you rightly said, of uh, uh, the kind of revelation, northern revelation about surveillance, uh, you know, the fact they are encryption and, and encryption, uh, they have played such a crucial role in the last, over the last two years. Uh, and so I think there is a space within that model uh, uh, even if it is liable to things like, you know, total internet blackout, such as in Iran, uh, there is a space, uh, space within this kind of new breed of apps uh, for this kind of uh, agile infrastructure for possibilities uh, that uh, Ravi was referring to. Uh, it's certainly, you know, Facebook and the others, like the largest internet company, can be sometimes used, but they are uh, engaged, uh, you know, in a, in a, uh, they have to secure the social, as I said, you know, in a previous article. So they have to keep the autopoietic machine uh, running. So, so they have to quash some things, you know, they have to kind of impose some kind of order. And I don't see that as happening in the apps. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think what is, what is so interesting and surprising is the way people have entered, particularly the chat apps worldwide. You saw how, how you know, people in Hong Kong use Telegram. Uh, and and in India, Telegram is very popular among students who share books with each other uh, outside copyright. Large amount of books. It's the biggest uh, book piracy network, uh, particularly for textbooks, which are so expensive. People share textbooks. So these are interesting uh, experiments. And it doesn't follow the classic socialist experiment model uh, that we all knew and know about. But I think it's important to hold on these exper- to these experiments. And I'm pretty, I, I, too, I spoke about the migrants because it's, you had this huge churn in the last 10 years. And uh, you, you, you have been very, very interesting practices of you know, managing life. And I think we will be much smarter uh, on, on some of these questions in, you know, in, in five, six years from now. Uh, and, but, but going back to the platform, uh, finally, I think the scale of it is also sometimes ruptured by uh, movements that enter ju- you know, juridical interventions. So uh, these are important. We seem to forget the scale of, you know, overwhelms us. But sometimes these juridical interventions, you know, court cases, uh, you know, uh, filing privacy worldwide. There are many court cases happening in India now against, against Facebook and, and Google. So these things are important. So, you know, the, the status quo is disrupted. I'm very convinced today. And we need to work, work from here. Okay, so I'd like to see if uh, either of you um, have any sort of last uh, comments or even just, uh, uh, even questions that you might want to raise um, before we before we wrap wrap things up here. No, really, just thanks. You know, the very 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 good question, very interesting question. Uh, uh, so thank you for the audience. You know, everybody who's been following this symposium for two weeks now. I think it must be a record they were setting or something. It's been a bit of a marathon. So I'm grateful to, to Ravi again for joining us today. And uh, thank you for your sharing, Tsikiel. Thank you. Thank you, Ezekiel. And thank you, Tiziana. I, I look forward to your book, uh, you know, the, the, and, and, the, uh, and the arguments. And, and I'm going to you know, follow the you know all the YouTube uh, videos of the symposium. Uh, you know, you know again, again and and offer some of my students to also see it. Thank you. So th- thank you both. This has been an absolutely invigorating, energetic, fascinating. I mean, I feel like I've gone on a a, 
um, part of tour through through history on, on social networks and questions around the social all the way through to questions around pirate modernity, um, uh, even the challenges and reconfigurings of governmentality and then through the enumeration of various forms of practices of biopolitics um, and even the potentialities of even subversive um, uh, uh, acts and through various forms of platforms. This has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you both. Um, thank, I would also thank um, all, Oh, Oana, my, my, uh, the co-host and, co and, and, and Joanna, Brian. <laughs> and Brian, yep. Um, and thank all of you for, for joining us, uh, the, the attendees. Um, all right. Um, I look forward to hopefully seeing you all on Saturday uh, for um, the next and last dialogue on um, mass debilitation and algorithmic governance that will be with um, myself and uh, Jasbir Fuar. Thank you. Thank you.